Good day and welcome to today's service. I hope that you are well and during these circumstances that you still find places to see beauty and experience love and that you keep connected with your loved ones, be it virtually, that we would remind ourselves that we are still connected to each other even though we can't get close to each other. Let us close our eyes. Lord, we thank you for the privilege to be part of your body. We also thank you for the privilege that you are present everywhere. We realize that there was a time that according to man, you were only present in a temple, in the holies of holies. But we know that you are everywhere, that you are with us today in our homes, in our cars, wherever we are listening to this service. We know that you are with us and we declare it, that you are God Emmanuel, God with us. We thank you that we can worship you in spirit and in truth and not in place and religion. And I pray that you would come and change our hearts and change our minds in the name of Jesus. Amen. I greet you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Psalm 121 says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I want to invite you to do a prayer with us, especially for a lot of the kids going back to school, that they would remain safe and that we also pray for the teachers who have to take care of these kids um, and the headmasters and all the, the officials trying to make sense of everything that's going on. And secondly, for families, families struggling financially, struggling with jobs, that we would dedicate them to the Lord today as well in prayer. Let's pray together. Lord, we ask that you give wisdom to every single teacher, to every single headmaster, and to every single child going back to school. We ask that you would keep our children safe, and keep our teachers safe. We also pray for every family that's struggling financially, every person who is looking for a new job, every person who is worried about being retrenched or losing his or her job, that you would please give us all wisdom and that we can keep on trusting you as our provider. In the name of Jesus, amen. We are going to sing two songs and I invite you to sit back and listen or even sing together, uh, sing with us. The first one is No Longer Slaves and the second one is Graves into Gardens. God is in the business of changing, changing what is bad into good, changing what is ugly into beautiful. Let's sing together.
Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. When you came along and put me back together.
It's such a privilege to sing from the depths of our hearts. And we just sang this song that you turn graves into gardens, bones into armies. And I pray that you would experience and realize the changing power of God in today's message. So I want to introduce you to one of the disciples, and his name is Peter, also referred to as Simon, and sometimes even called Simon Peter. And Peter was a fiery character. He is one of the guys, when Jesus came to them, he was fishing. And Jesus did a miracle that we read of in Luke 5, where they couldn't catch anything that day. And then suddenly Jesus appeared to them and said, cast your nets to the other side of the boat. And when they cast their nets, they got so many fish that the nets net started to tear because the fish were too heavy. And after that miracle, Jesus looked at Peter and he said, I will make you a fisher of man. Follow me. And Peter dropped everything and he took his life into a new direction and he started following Jesus. The second thing we read of Peter, or one of these fiery characteristics of Peter, is there was a day where the disciples were in a boat and they saw Jesus from afar, but they they weren't, they weren't convinced that it was Jesus. Some of them said it's a spirit or a ghost. But Peter stood up as his character and he said, If it's you, Jesus, let me walk to you. Now, if you're a reasonable man, you're not going to step out of a boat and try to walk on water. But that's the kind of attitudes, that's the kind of passion that Peter had in his life and in his heart. And he climbed out of the water, out of the boat, onto the water, and he actually walked on water until he saw the waves and the wind. And then he started to sink. And Jesus picked him up and said, Why did you leave? Why did you not keep your eyes on me? But why did you start looking at the winds and the waves? Now, this attitude of Peter also sometimes... Um, caused some trouble. Peter was the guy who chopped off the ear of the God, one of the gods who arrested Jesus. And then Jesus just told Peter that this is not the way we do things. Violence is not our answer. So that's Peter. The other thing that um, Peter also struggled with was speaking before thinking. So there's a certain time where Jesus gathers his disciples together and Jesus explains the plan of God to his disciples. And Jesus tells his disciples, I am going to die, but I will be raised again in three days. And then Peter stands up and he says, this will never happen. And we read of this in Matthew 16. I will fight beside you. And you will not die. And then Jesus looks at Peter and says, Go away from me, Satan. These are harsh words that Peter, that, that Peter has to hear and that Jesus says. And what Jesus is saying is, Peter, you do not understand what needs to happen. Do not interfere with the plans of God. I have to die. And you do not understand why this has to happen. But then in Matthew 26, Jesus and his disciples are sitting at a table and they are having the Last Supper. And then Jesus tells his disciples again that he has to go through a lot of suffering. And then Peter makes a promise to Jesus once again without actually thinking what he is saying. And Peter says, even if all fall on account of you, I never will. And then Jesus says to Peter, This very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. So Peter makes this promise to Jesus saying, you won't die and I will fight for you, but even if you have to die, I will die with you. And Jesus just says, 
my dear Peter, this very night, before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times. And that, that happens. We actually read about it. That very same night, Peter is asked three times, aren't you that, that guy who walks with, with Jesus? And Peter says, no, I don't know who you are talking about. Two times, three times. Aren't you that, that Peter that walks with Jesus? The one who's, who's, who's getting arrested, probably going to be crucified. Aren't you that guy? And Peter says, I've got no idea who you're talking about. And then the third time, when Peter denies Jesus, he hears the rooster crow. And he remembers the, word, the words of Jesus when Jesus told him that he will deny him three times. And he starts to cry and probably runs away. And then we get into this story of Jesus where he's crucified, he's resurrected, and he appears to his disciples, not once, not two times, but we're going to read of the third time as well today. But in the first appearance, Jesus says nothing to Peter. In the second appearance, Jesus says nothing to Peter, especially regarding to his denial. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when someone aggravated me or someone irritated me, I choose to remain silent because it's easier just to ignore my anger or ignore the conflict than to face it, than to tell that person, you really hurt me. And then I have some other friends who just handle conflict differently. They just leave it in they do not say anything about what happened in the past. And maybe this is unconsciously what was going on in Peter's mind. Well, I saw Jesus once and he didn't say anything. Maybe he's forgiven me and maybe he's moved on. I saw him twice and he, he, he didn't say anything. Maybe he's forgiven me. Or maybe he's just keeping quiet because he is still angry at me. But maybe he's forgiven me. So then we get to the scene on a beach at the Sea of Galilee where they are fishing again. Can you see how they just moved back three years again? They were world-changing disciples and now Jesus has died and they don't know what's going on and they're just fishing again. So some of them are fishing and Peter and John is um, also there in the boat. And they see someone making a fire on the shoreline. And one of the guys says, hey, I think that's, that's Jesus. I think that's the risen Jesus. And then Jesus shouts to them, have you caught anything? And they say, no. And Jesus performs the same miracle that he did in Luke 5 at the beginning of Peter's ministry that day on the beach after his res resurrection. Jesus tells them to cast the nets to the other side. And then they get so many fish that the nets once again can't hold everything. It actually says specifically 153 fish they catch that day. And then John says, that's Jesus. Because he did the same thing that he did three years ago. And Peter, as his character, he jumps out of the boat. He lifts up his robe. He runs to Jesus to the shore. And probably thinking, well, Jesus has been quiet for two visitations, so he has forgiven me. And then we get this beautiful part in John 21, which is the last chapter of John, verse 15. But before we read, let's close our eyes just as a thanks that we have the word of God um, to read. Let's close our eyes. Lord, we thank you for this word. We ask that your word will come alive in our hearts and in our minds today. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So I'm going to read for us. John 21, verse 15 to 17. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, son of, um, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. 
You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now in this conversation between Peter and Jesus, we find the full restoration of Peter. And, and why, why do I say that? I say that because there's a couple of things that happen here. Firstly, the forgiveness is not a simple once-off. That's fine, you're forgiven. It's a full forgiveness. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. How many times does Jesus ask Peter, do you love me? Three times. He is cancelling out every denial so that Peter can truly be forgiven and realize that Jesus truly, truly forgives him. Sometimes when someone hurts me, I am still hurt even if that person asks for forgiveness and I will say something like, it's fine, it's fine. But in my attitude and in my heart, you can see that I have not really forgiven that person. But Jesus takes away all doubt when he asks Peter three times. Do you love me truly more than these? Do you truly love me? Peter, do you love me? And he cancels out the sin. He cancels out the hurt. And Peter can truly live fully restored. The second thing that we see in this passage, maybe you, you caught it, maybe you didn't, is that Jesus demands authenticity. It's, it's actually, Jesus starts with a big love. He says, do you truly love me more than these? He's talking about disciples, all the disciples there. Do you love me all more than everyone here? John, Mark, every, uh, Matthew, everyone. And I don't think he can honestly answer that question as a yes, I do more than everyone here. He just simply says, Lord, I love you. His answer is, you know that I love you. And then Jesus comes with a second question and it's a, a step lower. It's not more than these. It's just, Peter, do you truly love me? And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then the third question is actually the lowest step. It's just, do you love me? And Peter gets uh, hurt or frustrated and he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Now, I don't want to go into the technicalities of this, but the word love is a strange word because we say, I love God, I love my wife, and I love pizza. And we know that even, even though it's the same word, it does not carry the same weight when I say, I love watching TV as when I say, I love my wife or I love God. And in the same way, in the Greek language, there are different words that we have to look at the context to understand really what these words mean. And the interesting thing is that Jesus w uses a specific word when he asks the first time, Peter, do you, do you love me? He, he uses a word agape. And Peter answers with a word that has to do with friendship. It's almost as if Jesus is asking, do you love me? And Peter says, I like you. And then the second time, exactly the same. Jesus says, do you love me? And Peter responds with this word, I like you. And the interesting thing is the third time, Jesus doesn't say, do you love me? If we can translate it like that. Jesus says the third time, Peter, do you at least like me? And then Peter gets hurt. 
And he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I like you. Peter never responds with the same word that Jesus asks the first and the second time. And then they get to a point where the third question actually says, do you, do you at least like me, Peter? Yes, I like you, Jesus. Okay, now we can move forward. And then Jesus goes on to tell Peter how he is going to glorify him in the future by dying for him, dying for Jesus. Jesus demands authenticity. Sometimes we would say to to the Lord in song, we would say, I love you, Lord, with all my heart. But in actual fact, being honest, we can only say, today I like you, Lord. But that's all I can say for today. And then Jesus says, now we can start speaking because now you're being authentic. Now you're being real. Don't tell me you love me with all your heart when you don't. At least be honest with me, because then we can live in a, in a relationship. And then the third thing that we have to see is that love is not just a fuzzy word for Jesus or a fuzzy feeling or something that we experience. Love for Jesus is an action. What does Jesus respond every time that Peter responds? He gives him a commandment. Firstly, feed my lambs. Secondly, take care of my sheep. Thirdly, feed my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, I love you. Go and do what I ask you to do. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, I do, Jesus. Okay, go and do what I ask you to do. Love for Jesus is an action. Love for Jesus is being a better person tomorrow than you were today. Love for Jesus is is taking care of other people who are in need. Love for Jesus is loving other people. There's an infinite loop in the theology of the Bible because the most important law, according to Jesus, is love God and love others. And then we read in 1 John, what is love? Love is to be obedient to God. And to be obedient is to love. And to love is to be obedient. And to be obedient is to love. We cannot separate obedience from love. So Jesus says, do you love me? Do what I ask you to do. Do you love me? Be obedient. I send you out to do my work, to love, to take care of other people. It reminds me of a passage in the Old Testament of one of the prophets that we read of in Amos 5. And it's actually a weird passage because it sits strangely within us. But the Lord says, I hate, I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with your noise of your songs, I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. God already in the Old Testament says, it's not about religion. It's about love and justice and taking care of each other. May you in the first place be fully restored by the forgiveness of Christ and his death on the cross and the resurrection. May you have an authentic relationship with God, not lying to Him when you sing, not lying to Him when you pray, just to get it over with. And may you do what He asks you to do because of your love for Him and His love for you. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this amazing transformation of Peter and that we can also grab onto that, Lord, we come and we, we confess our sins. We confess our wrongdoings to you, Lord. And we know and believe that you can fully restore us when we come to you. Lord, help us to be authentic before you. Let us not lie when we speak to you because that's just 
It's just dumb to lie to the creator of heaven and earth. And Lord, we ask that you would give us the guts to do what you ask of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We now have the opportunity to bless the Lord with our offerings. Thank you for joining us today and we'll see you again next week. Have a great week. Be safe and receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.